Hello everyone, welcome back to History 2001. In this video, we're going to begin our discussion of the American Revolutionary War. The American Revolutionary War began in 1775 with the battles of Lexington and Concord, and it continued until 1783 uh, with the Treaty of Paris, which ended the fighting between uh, the British and uh, the American colonists. Most of the major fighting, though, in the uh, American Revolutionary War had come to an end by 1781. In this video, we're only going to cover the Revolutionary War in New England and the Mid-Atlantic colonies, roughly from 1775 through 1778. Also, don't forget that while the shooting began between the colonists and the British in 1775, the American colonies had experienced over a decade of revolutionary turmoil since the end of the French and Indian War in 1763. We discussed the reasons for this upheaval in previous videos. With this context in mind, we will begin our discussion in 1775. By the spring of 1775, the colonists of Massachusetts had been preparing for war with Great Britain for almost a year. After the Intolerable Acts of 1774, which dissolved Massachusetts' independent government, patriots in the colony formed their own provisional government. The Massachusetts provisional government's goal was to arm and organize militia companies to fight the British Army in the event of a war with Great Britain. The Massachusetts provincial government gained wide support outside of the coastal urban centers. By February of 1775, the provincial government and its militias effectively controlled all of Massachusetts outside of Boston. In response, the British government declared Massachusetts to be in a state of rebellion, and the British garrison at Boston, under General Thomas Gage, was ordered to invade the Bay Colony's backcountry in order to neutralize the militias and apprehend the provisional government's leadership. When patriots in Boston learned of the British garrison's planned campaign into the interior, they used an early alert system that included signal lanterns and midnight riders who would convey intelligence of the British movements to the provincial government and militia. On April 18th, General Gage ordered his troops to embark onto boats and to travel from Boston northwest up the Charles River to Cambridge, where they would disembark and march northwestward to Concord. Concord and the nearby village of Lexington were at the center of the provisional government's operations. Essentially, the towns served as Patriot Massachusetts' capital. Its leaders, including John Hancock and Samuel Adams, held court in Lexington, and the militia kept its arms and materiel in Concord. If the British could move secretly and decisively, they could sever the head of the rebellious snake that controlled rural Massachusetts and bring the colony back into line. The Patriots of Boston, however, managed to relay the message that the British were going to strike Lexington and Concord. Lamps hung in Boston's Old North Church, one if by land and two if by sea, as Henry W. Longfellow's 1860 poem read, signaled that the British were departing Boston. It should be noted that the troops were traveling upriver, not across the ocean, as Longfellow's poem suggests. Patriots across the river in Charlestown saw the lanterns of dispatched riders, including Paul Revere and Billy Dawes, who carried the news of the impending assault through the Massachusetts countryside on their midnight rides, which had been heavily mythologized, as discussed before. Revere and Dawes probably did not loudly shout, the British are coming, as numerous poems, songs, and films and other works of art suggest. Instead, Revere remembered saying, the regulars, the British Army, are coming out, since American colonists, even many patriots, 
still tend to think of themselves as British in 1775. Additionally, when Revere and Dawes entered a village or town, they did not publicly make their presence known. Instead, they would secretly inform the municipality's patriot cell of the invasion, and the cell would dispatch additional riders to carry the message of the impending attack in order to spread the news more quickly. In the end, there may have been as many as 40 midnight riders clandestinely spreading the word about the imminent British raid. Revere reached Lexington around 1 a.m. and informed Hancock and Adams of the invading British task force, which numbered over 700 effective troops. The men determined that Lexington was not the party's only target, since such a large force was not needed to arrest two men. They assumed correctly that the Concord Arms Store, or magazine in colonial parlance, was their second objective. At Lexington, another rider, Samuel Prescott, joined Revere and Dawes. As the men rode toward Concord, they were stopped by a British patrol that had barricaded the road. Revere was captured, but Dawes and Prescott escaped. Revere was released later that morning. Although his horse was confiscated, Dawes lost his horse in the escape, but Prescott maintained control of his mount and got word of the attack to Concord. The Patriot riders, Revere, Dawes, Prescott, and those that followed them, carried messages to municipalities up to 25 miles outside of Boston, before the British force had even disembarked at Cambridge, dashing Britain's hope for a surprise attack. while also showing the efficacy of the colonial message warning system. Now, I've gone into a lot of detail about Paul Revere's ride and the militarization of rural Massachusetts. I've gone into so much detail because I wanted to demonstrate how well organized the militias in Patriot municipal governments were as well as their effectiveness in maintaining control of large portions of rural colonial America. The militias were more than just volunteer community armies. They had been the colonial defense force for over a century and had gained significant experience during various wars against the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, and Native Americans. Additionally, the militia and service in it had become a critical part of colonists' civic culture, much like voting or, or serving as a volunteer firefighter slash sheriff's deputy today. The militia would serve as a critical civil defense security force for the Patriots during the American Revolutionary War, much like the U.S. National Guard does today. The militias provided security in the Patriot heartland, acting as intelligence agents, messengers, and as a constabulary. The Patriot militias also enforced laws and policed their communities, in some cases suppressing loyalist sentiment in Patriot territory. When used properly, the militia was very effective as a civil defense and light infantry force, perfectly adapted to help the Patriot leadership maintain control of its territory. Where the militia faltered, however, was in pitched battles against the British Army. There were many reasons for why the militia struggled in full-scale battles against regular British troops. The Battle of Lexington, the first military engagement between Great Britain and the American colonists, offers some clues. Although the Patriot militias of Massachusetts had been alerted of the British attack, through their effective emergency warning riders, the Patriots were only able to muster about 77 militiamen, called Minutemen, to face the British force, which numbered about 700. The Minutemen, while able to ready themselves to fight on a moment's notice, were reticent to deploy too far from their own communities. 
Although the Massachusetts provincial government mandated that all the militias, about 4,000 effectives, must come together to fight the British, the community militia companies did not want to march too far from their hometowns for fear of leaving their families, homes, and fields unguarded. This home-based approach made sense when the colonial militias fought against Native Americans, who attacked settlements using small, highly mobile raiding parties, but the British attacked single targets using much larger strike forces. So, although the Patriots greatly outnumbered the British attack force, 4,000 to 700, they failed to get more than 77 men to face the British at Lexington. The Minutemen established a skirmish line in Lexington's town square and waited for the British to advance. Lexington's militia commander, Captain John Parker, a French and Indian War veteran, ordered the militiamen and Minutemen not to fire on the British unless they were fired upon first. The British commander of the attack, Francis Smith, who was under General Gage, ordered the rebels to disperse. What happened next is a mystery. Someone fired. We do not know who, but this opening round, the shot heard round the world, began the American Revolutionary War. Hearing the shot, the British regulars fired a barrage into the militia, and the militia, shocked by the live salvo, failed to return fire in a disciplined manner. The regulars then charged the militia with fixed bayonets, and the greatly outnumbered militiamen were forced to retreat under pressure from the more disciplined British force. Having routed the militia at Lexington, the British regulars marched on to Concord. At Concord, the militia used a better strategy. Rather than facing a larger force in the open, as the Lexington militia and Minutemen had done, the Concord troops concealed themselves and allowed the British to enter the town. The Patriot arsenal had been moved outside of the city, and the British regulars wasted critical time looking for it, allowing additional militia and Minutemen to reach Concord to face them. As the British left the city of Concord, Having failed to capture the Patriot Arms Store, the colonial militia, having mustered over 400 troops, engaged the British as they crossed the North Bridge outside of the town. This bridge feature was a perfect choke point. The British troops had to cross in close ranks, while the Patriot militia and sharpshooters poured fire down into their formation. The Patriots also used the bridge to make up for their limited numbers bringing all their strength to bear against separate attachments of British regulars crossing the bridge. Essentially, the Patriots were using the bridge as a choke point and a force multiplier. The exhausted British force, having failed to capture the Patriot leadership and militia arsenal, began its retreat back to Boston. Along the way, the British ranks were harassed by Patriot snipers firing from concealment. In the end, the regulars' campaign was a defeat for the British. The regulars had failed in their primary objectives to capture the Patriot leadership and weapons, and they had endured heavy casualties from a smaller opposing force. The Patriots had 49 killed in action, 37 wounded, and 5 unaccounted for while the British had 73 KIA, 174 WIA, and 53 missing. Just like before, I have provided a lot of information in detail about the battles of Lexington and Concord, the first military engagements of the American Revolutionary War. I have done this because these two initial battles were very representative of how the American Revolutionary War was fought. The British grand strategy was centered around the occupation of major cities on the coast. From their coastal bases, the British army would penetrate Patriot territory in the interior in order to destroy colonial supplies and capture its leadership, while also rallying loyalists 
and on the frontier, Native Americans to their cause. The Patriot forces, the militias, and later the Continental Army, the Patriots regular army, were usually outnumbered and were more likely to be victorious against the British when they fought from cover and made sneak attacks, as seen during the Battle at Concord. The militias, as was the case at Lexington and Concord, preferred not to be deployed far from their homes. The militiamen had families and regular jobs, and they could not afford to be gone for too long. Otherwise, they would not be able to tend to their crops or work in their businesses. The Continental Army, made up of professional troops, had issues with desertion as well, but it did not have to worry about large numbers of its ranks leaving before their terms of enlistment were up to take care of matters back at home. Before we continue with our discussion, I just want to get some background out of the way regarding the arms, equipment, and uniforms used during the American Revolutionary War. I'm providing this information for a variety of reasons, including because many OSU students are not from the United States and have not grown up learning about the American Revolution in grade school. The British regular troops wore their iconic red uniforms, for the most part. Musketeers wore the common tricorn hat, the standard male head cover in Europe and the colonies in the 18th century. Grenadiers, considered Britain's elite shock troops, wore high crown bearskin hats designed to make the soldiers look taller and more physically intimidating. A similar type of cover was worn by Britain's European allies, namely the German Hessians. On the Patriot side, the soldiers of the Continental Army the Patriots' full-time professional soldiers mostly wore blue uniforms with red trim. The Continental Troops also wore brown uniform coats with a similar red trim. Although on the whole, there was more variety of uniforms in the Continental Army than there was in the British forces. The militias on both sides in the American Revolution did not have standard uniforms. Their dress varied based on their unit and local logistical challenges. Green coats with red trim were a popular uniform for both Loyalist and Patriot militia units. Interestingly, Patriot militiamen favored a type of loose-fitting linen smock called a hunting jacket as an alternative to traditional military uniforms. The hunting jacket was made of linen and was decorated with a fringe. This garment was a fusion of European and Native American fashion. As stated before, Loyalist militia also did not have stamp single standardized uniforms. Many wore green, a popular militia uniform color but many militia on the British side also wore red. For arms, both the British and the Patriots used a variety of muskets. The British Army favored the Brown Bess model, a smooth bore musket that while ina very inaccurate, was quick and easy to load. Cavalry, often called dragoons during the American Revolutionary War, were armed with single smoothbore pistols, although some soldiers carried more than one pistol because of the long loading time of smoothbores. Cavalry and officers also carried sabers. The Patriots, in particular, favored the Kentucky Long Rifle, a single shot rifled muzzle loader that was far more accurate than the Brown Bess musket, although it took much longer to load. The Kentucky Long Rifle fit very well strategically 
with the Patriot Militia's preference for firing from cover and sharpshooting against the British. The Patriot forces, as demonstrated at the Battle of Lexington, were also not afraid to retreat from the British when victory was impossible. The Battle of Bunker Hill, actually fought on Breed's Hill, of June 17, 1775, outside of Boston, saw an undersupplied Patriot militia fight against the British regulars. The Patriots were outnumbered 2,400 to 3,000 but they deployed on the high ground of a hill and created a fortified strong point by digging entrenchments on the hill's crest. The British attacked and forced the Patriots to give up the hill. The Patriots commander, Colonel William Prescott, realized the troops' logistical problem and is reputed to have ordered his militiamen to conserve their rounds and fire at close range, although we don't know if he actually said to wait to see the whites of the British soldiers eyes before firing. Anyway, the British captured Bunker Hill, but they did so with great casualties, losing over 1,000 troops. The Americans lost about 450. Among the dead on the American side were men like Dr. Joseph Warren, a physician and important patriot leader in Massachusetts. On the British side, the dead included many, including officers like Major Joseph Pitcairn. While Bunker Hill was a tactical victory for the British, the battle proved a strategic loss for the British Army in the long term. In response to the battle and its high casualties, the British government ordered its troops to evacuate from Boston as Patriot resistance in England was deemed to be too great. The last British troops left Boston the Cradle of the American Revolution, on March 17, 1776. It is also worth noting that during this time, the Patriots would penetrate Upper New England, present-day Vermont, and upstate New York, capturing the British redoubt at Fort Ticonderoga. Vermonter Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold, the future British turncoat, led this raid. The artillery the Patriots captured at Fort Ticonderoga will be placed around Boston, essentially preventing the British from leaving the city without high casualties. This development also contributed to Britain's decision to withdraw from Boston in early 1776. In addition, in late 1775, the Patriots would also invade Quebec hoping to turn the French, Canadian, Quebecois people against the British, their former enemies in the French and Indian War. This campaign was a failure for the Americans as they attacked in December during the cold of winter and their incursion did not provoke a mass Canadian uprising against British rule. Rather, the Quebecois supported the British, remembering how the American colonists had previously condemned them for their Catholicism in French culture. I also want to mention some of the political developments that were taking place in uh, 1775 and 1776. As the British were preparing to assault New York City, uh, the Second Continental Congress, the governing body of the uh, 13 colonies that were rebelling against Great Britain, um, they continued to meet in Philadelphia. By the way, the Second Continental Congress uh, began to meet in May of 1775, shortly after the battles of Lexington and Concord. Uh, for context, the largest cities in the colonies were, number one, uh, Philadelphia at 40,000 people. Uh, Philadelphia will be the first capital of the United States of America. Uh, New York City had about 21,000 people. 
making it, generally speaking, the second uh, largest urban center in the American colonies. And then number three is Boston at about 17,000 people. Sometimes Boston is counted as number two, uh, being larger than New York City, but that's usually when uh, scholars count uh, Salem, a, su a suburb of Boston, as being part of Boston. So either way, Philadelphia is the largest city by a long shot. And uh, New York City is either the second or sometimes the third largest city, depending on how you define uh, these urban centers. Either way, though, New York City is a very important uh, urban center, which is why uh, the British wanted to capture it. So now I'll talk a bit about what the Continental Congress was doing and what um, the American Patriot cause wanted uh, in, in 1776. Initially, the Patriots had wanted to remain within the British Empire and gain uh, more rights or gain the rights they believed they were entitled to as British subjects. Uh, but the British government's hardening of its policies against the rebelling colonies, um, things like attacks on American shipping vessels uh, that were not part of the Patriot movement, uh, things like the British calling for foreign allies and foreign support, uh, like the Hessians, um, to be used against the American colonies. These things convinced uh, American Patriots that in order to have independence or freedom, they needed to be outside of the British Empire. Uh, just being British subjects was not going to be enough. They needed to be independent. Also, uh, Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, which was published uh, early in 1776, made a case for independence uh, using Enlightenment principles. And um, Common Sense was a sensation in the American colonies. It was a very popular pamphlet. It had very wide circulation. It was read at uh, taverns and coffee houses. It was one of the most uh, popular um, uh, English uh, documents ever written. And it inspired a lot of people to decide that they needed independence uh, from Great Britain. As such, the delegates of the Continental Congress, realizing the need for independence, they decided they needed to have a document uh, in which they would declare independence and show that they, the Continental Congress, had authority to um, call for independence from Great Britain. In order to justify um, independence, which would have been a treasonous act, they felt they needed to list their grievances against uh, King George III and uh, the British government. And the delegates chose uh, what's called the Committee of Five, uh, five men that would uh, write this uh, Declaration of Independence document. Those men included Thomas Jefferson, uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, John Adams, and others, who we'll talk about uh, on the next slide. The Congress appointed a committee of five men, including Benjamin Franklin and future presidents John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, to produce this declaration. The committee worked to draft a legal document that would list the grievances the colonies had against Britain and why independence was both necessary and justified. Adams chose Jefferson to do the writing, as Jefferson was a talented wordsmith. Additionally, Jefferson was the only Southerner on the committee, and Adams knew that the Southern colonies were more on the fence about independence than New England or even the Mid-Atlantic. The committee took no minutes, but later accounts revealed that Jefferson, being the youngest committee member, was nervous about writing the declaration, and that Adams had to get Jefferson drunk to entice him into writing the document. Jefferson worked for over two weeks to write the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. Then, the committee presented the document to all of the delegates, who shortened the manuscript and removed Jefferson's grievance that Britain had forced slavery on the colonies. It is worth noting that Jefferson was one of Virginia's largest slaveholders, and that most of America's founding fathers had owned slaves at some point in their lives. Jefferson's definition of slavery as a grievance was removed from the final draft of the Declaration of Independence to appease the deep southern colonists who relied on slavery in a way that the northern colonists did not. The final draft of the Declaration of Independence declared that all men were created equal and endowed by their creator 
with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. An obvious reference to the Enlightenment thinker, John Locke, who wrote that freedom was the right to life, liberty, and property. The Declaration of Independence then outlined how Britain had violated the colonists' God-given rights by not giving them political representation, quartering troops in their communities, and sending foreign mercenaries, like the German-speaking Hessians, to the colonies. More problematically, the Declaration of Independence declared that Britain was responsible for inciting savage, quote-unquote, Indians to attack frontier colonists, and for inciting domestic insurrections, loyalist attacks, and slave rebellions within the colonies. It is true that Britain had Native American allies who did attack Patriot territory, and it was also true that the British had offered freedom to the slaves of Patriot masters if they would join the British Army. The Declaration of Independence, for all its talk of freedom and equality, regarded hostile Native Americans as savages, failing to mention the grievances that indigenous people might have against the colonists, and it delegitimized African Americans' desire for freedom. While its flaws today are obvious, we must admire the courage of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. In signing this document, they were committing an act of high treason against Great Britain, a crime punishable by death. When Benjamin Franklin, urging unity against the Patriots, said, we must indeed all hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately, he was not speaking hyperbolically. He meant that the Patriots had to either win or die. In spite of issues with the Declaration of Independence, Congress ratified the document and began the signing process on July 4, 1776. Although the document was signed over the course of the summer and fall, with the last signature being affixed in November. Nonetheless, July 4, 1776 is celebrated as Independence Day or the 4th of July here in the US. Now that we've discussed the Declaration of Independence, we will return to the fighting of the American Revolutionary War. George Washington, commander of the United States of America's professional Continental Army, realized he would not be able to stop the British from capturing New York City. Washington fought a series of delaying engagements on Long Island and Harlem as he fell back into the interior. Unfortunately, he left a garrison of 3,000 troops behind who, isolated from the rest of the Continental Army, were captured by the British in November of 1776. Prisoners of war during the American Revolution experienced harsh treatment in their confinement. The British favored imprisoning their Patriot POWs on old sinking ships called Jerseys. Conditions on these vessels were terrible. Overcrowding, disease, lack of food and medical care, all contributed to the misery of the prisoners. The Patriots also treated their British and Loyalist prisoners poorly as well. In the winter of 1776 and 1777, the 13 colonies' struggle against Great Britain seemed bleak. The Patriots had regained Boston at the beginning of 1776, and they had officially declared their independence, but they had lost New York City, a much larger urban center. To make matters worse, an ongoing smallpox epidemic raged through the ranks. Washington, though he was outnumbered and outgunned, had also made some key tactical errors in his retreat from New York. Morale was low amongst the army in its winter quarters in New Jersey. What they needed was a victory, 
They got it at the Battle of Trenton, fought on Christmas, 1776. Washington and his Continental troops, under cover of darkness, crossed the ice-laden Delaware River to strike a Hessian garrison at Trenton. The Hessians were German allies of Britain and were eagerly celebrating Christmas, with many of their troops being intoxicated. At the time, armies rarely attacked during the winter in Europe, but the American colonists were very accustomed to wintertime attacks, especially against Native Americans so that they could destroy the Indians' winter food stores and force them to surrender. Additionally, Christmas was not widely celebrated by Protestant colonial Anglo-Americans. They associated the holiday with Catholicism. The Battle of Trenton was one of the most important victories that the Continental Army scored against Great Britain and its allies, and it was an important morale boost during a low point for Patriot morale. In 1777, the British and the Americans continued their struggle in the Mid-Atlantic. Invading southward from Canada along the Hudson River Valley, British General John Burgoyne expected to gather Native American and Loyalist allies to attack the Patriots in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Burgoyne vastly overestimated the number of Loyalists in the American backcountry. and Native Americans, who generally supported Britain over the Patriots, did not rally to the British flag in the numbers that Burgoyne had expected. The lack of support that Burgoyne received in the Hudson River Valley was primarily due to the power of colonial militias, which, although they struggled against disciplined regular troops, were very effective as an internal security force keeping the Loyalists from organizing or joining the British. If Burgoyne had been successful, the British would have effectively separated staunchly Patriot New England from the less committed Mid-Atlantic and Southern colonies, using the Hudson River as a boundary between Patriot and British-occupied territory. The Continental Army and Patriot militias engaged the British on September 19th and October 7th, 1777 at Saratoga in New York. The Patriots in these battles actually outnumbered the British, and they made good use of their militiamen, using them as sharpshooters, who hid in natural cover and fired on the tight ranks of British troops. The Continental Army also made excellent use of fortifications to minimize its casualties as well. The Patriots surrounded Burgoyne's beleaguered army, and without hope of reinforcements, Burgoyne was forced to surrender. The American victory at Saratoga, while an important tactical victory and morale booster for the Patriot cause, had a larger international significance. The Patriots' victory convinced France to officially join the war as American allies to fight against their old enemy, Great Britain, in February of 1778, just a few months after the Saratoga victory. Before this, Frenchmen like the Marquis de Lafayette supported the Patriots, but now, the French nation would officially support the new United States. Because of the French intervention and the monumental nature of the Saratoga victory, scholars generally consider the Battle of Saratoga to be the turning point of the American Revolution, from which point the tide of war increasingly turned in favor of the American patriots. Although the Battle of Saratoga signaled a turning of the tide in favor of the Americans, the Patriots would endure many challenges and hardships in 1777 and 1778. The British, under General Charles Cornwallis, captured Philadelphia, 
the Patriot capital, and location where the Declaration of Independence had been signed. Because of the loss of this city, Washington's troops were forced to spend the brutally cold 1777 through 1778 winter in an outdoor camp at Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. The undersupplied Continental regulars suffered from a lack of food and proper winter gear, and many died from malnutrition and exposure. On the positive side, the Continental Army's military discipline increased during the winter of 1777 and 78, thanks to reforms and training conducted by Baron Friedrich von Steuben, a Prussian officer who supported the Patriot cause. Once again, highlighting how the Americans were gaining international recognition in their fight against the British. Von Steuben's trainees carried the training and knowledge they had received back to other parts of the Continental Army, transforming this Patriot military force into a more disciplined fighting unit. In the year 1778, the British failed to gain much ground in the Mid-Atlantic. The abrupt resignation of General William Howe and his replacement with the less competent Sir Henry Clinton, combined with the French entrance into the war, forced Britain to act more cautiously in the region. The British even retreated back to New York, abandoning Philadelphia in June of 1778. From this point, the war in the Mid-Atlantic would be mostly a stalemate, with the British and the Patriots trading victories and defeats, but the British failing to gain any new ground in the region. Because of this, the British High Command recognized that it needed to focus on new theaters of operations in the American colonies. Namely, the British decided to begin a campaign in the Southern colonies, where they expected to find more loyalist support. We'll talk about how the American Revolution was fought in the South in our next video. The American colonists pursued war with Great Britain for a variety of reasons. Colonists across, across the Atlantic coast opposed British taxes and their lack of representation in Parliament, among other issues. They believed that the British government and military's actions had justified their armed resistance, first for personal defense and the redress of grievances, and after July 4, 1776, for independence. To make this happen, the colonists used time-honored institutions like the militia to resist the British Army, as seen during the fighting in New England and, to a lesser degree, the Mid-Atlantic. The militia was effective when deployed as it had been during previous wars, as a civil defense force, constabulary, and concealed light infantry. Conversely, the militia struggled when forced to fight in pitched battles against the more disciplined British regulars, or when they were deployed too far from their home communities. In spite of these issues, the new United States had done well enough in its struggle against Great Britain to gain support from France in 1778. Other nations would come to support the United States in later years. We will discuss how the Patriots achieved victory in our next video.